The year is 2006, and the USA is playing Russia in the FIBA World Cup semi-final in Brazil. Everyone's expecting America to win, once again setting up a face-off with the Opals for tomorrow night's gold medal game. But hold on, something odd is happening. I'll never forget sitting there and watching that game as well and that unfolding, thinking, oh my goodness, that this, this is really happening. USA are about to be beaten. And I remember us walking out the tunnel and we're getting back on the bus. And in that moment, we knew we were going to win the gold medal. The following day, it is the Opals who triumph over Russia. 50 years in the making. The Opals are now champions of the world. That was the first gold medal that we'd won in Australia for men or women, and still is to this day. It was bizarre, you know, because never in my wildest dreams had I imagined we'd be playing in a, in a gold medal playoff match um, against a different country than America. With another accolade to come, Penny Taylor is named the World Cup's most valuable player. We'd had some really tough games in that tournament. Nine games in 11 days back then. It was tough, I was exhausted. <laughs> I just remember being so happy. Just the joy, like the pure joy of winning. I and mean, you just can't beat it. Being able to do it in the green and gold. I don't think we did go to bed that night. We've only ever been world champions once and um, that was one of the most special times of my life. So, you know, we really did enjoy it. Arriving home to a frenzy of celebrations and widespread media coverage, coach Jan Sterling remembers those who came before, writing a personal letter to every Opal over the past 50 years, thanking them for helping to carve the path to the mountaintop. It was bigger than us. It wasn't, it wasn't about me, it wasn't about Lauren, it wasn't about Christy, it was about the green and gold and every other opal um, that had come before us. And I get emotional thinking about it because when you're willing to put the name on the back away and play for the name on the front, winning, I think, finds you um, rather than you trying to search for it. For an entire decade, Australia does the unbelievable, winning a medal at every major championship in the 2000s. This is a remarkable time, the Opals at their most spectacular. Oh, that decade was phenomenal, um, the best in history, obviously, and uh, to win that first ever gold medal at a World Cup was something special. And it wasn't just Jacko, she had a cast of awesome players around her that just set the world on fire and enabled us to win that gold medal, the one and only in Brazil. With Tully Bevilacqua finally making her debut at 34, she joined with Rahani Cox to become the first Indigenous Opals Olympians. Added to the world class of Tims, Ma, Brondello, Spawn, Fallon and Gorman, the Aussies arrive at the Beijing Olympics with a self-assuredness. All of it built on experience, tenacity and grit. That was one of the great things about the Opals during my tenure was that everybody knew what their roles were. Christy Harrower, she can shoot from anywhere. She's a little floor general. Knows every single play inside and out from any position. Very smart. Penny Taylor, everybody knows Penny. What she brings defensively and offensively is just, you know, unmatched really. Susie Bakovic, scorer. She doesn't care, you give her the ball, she's gonna shoot it. Tully Bevilacqua, a lot of energy. Jenny Screen, defensive stopper, tough, tough as nails. And I think that was one of the things about um, that team was just that everybody was just tough. There was no excuses. We were all there for each other and win or lose, we did it together. Coach Sterling is exacting and demanding. Her focus on technical elite defence while cashing in on the scoring power of Jackson, Taylor, Harrower, Bakovic, Snell and Whittle. She was quick to pull us up on mistakes. She made it clear that there was no room for error and she was hard on us. It could bring out the best in players at times and it, it certainly did um, as a unit uh, at that time in our lives, yeah. I don't envy coaches 
coaching elite teams, I think it's one of the hardest jobs in the world. And uh, the way you have to manage them, the the personalities, the frustrations, the egos, the divas, like they're there. She had to navigate that a lot. Many observers believe Christy Harrower belongs with the world's best point guards. I always believe to be a good point guard or a great point guard is about knowing what play to run for what person at what time and understanding tempo. Man, Christy Harrower has all the points for Australia. When I'd watch video, I just didn't watch video. I'd study it. As soon as I stepped over that white line, I was so confident in what I did. Not I was arrogant, I was just confident. Like I went to school and I was never confident, but when I was on a basketball court, I don't know, it just I was a very different person. I think that's one thing that kept driving me. I wanted to walk away and people say she was one of the smartest players that played the game. This is Australia at its best. Working the court in symphony, beating the giants of China, Russia, Brazil and Korea. Yet once again, in the gold medal game, the US stands in the way. The Americans were always the dominant team. They were always the best. But in the same breath, we definitely thought that we could win a gold. There's, there's no doubt about it. Um, but it was, it was one of those things where the stars really had to align. And uh, yeah, I, I guess they didn't. Any successful team needs great players, which they had. For the most part, egos were kept in check and it was about team before self. So it wasn't you and me, it was always us. It was about the team. For me, I think it started a lot with Tom Ma, with his group. I mean, we had so many themes with him that we uh, lived by every day. And, you know, it's about being a we group, um, relentless, persistent, uh, you know, work hard. Like, it was all those things that he, um, you know, continually every day, every session, every game, every team meeting, he would talk about. Any time we stepped over the white line, if it was training or a game, we'd always give 100%. That's just the way we were. There was no mediocre. If we were playing against a rookie at training or a senior, we'd go at them because we're like, well, rookie, if you want my spot, you got to come and get it. We were relentless. We wore teams down over 40 minutes. It wasn't the first quarter, it wasn't second quarter, but our defence was just in-your-face type defence. I was always fit when I was younger, and I first started with Tom, and I think I could play his style for about three minutes, and I was dead, because it was run, run in offence and press full court defence, man to man. So it was really tough. Ending an era, Sterling steps down, the longest serving Opals coach to date. Jan knows the game inside out. She, she was a great coach. She knew what plays to run. She kept that team at the very top. There, there was only one team better than us for a really long time. As much as people might have something to say about Jan and her coaching style, she is one of, if not the best coach the Australian team has ever had. In 2010, it's time for the rising star of coaches, Carrie Graff, a long-time assistant, to step up. She too has an intimate knowledge of what it will take to harness the collective grit and talent of this team. Winning medals at World Championship basketball events and Olympic tournaments is tough. It's tough business. It's a world game. The world superpowers play it. This isn't tiddlywinks. The 2010 FIBA World Cup is hosted by the Czech Republic, and the home team plays out of its skin in the quarters, sending Australia out of medals contention to an uncomfortable fifth place. I mean, in sport terms, it was devastating. But Australia will rise again. The team culture is solid and knows how to dig deep, a virtue that's respected across the world. There's optimism in the emerging stars of Cambage, O'Hay, Tolo and Somerton. Coach Graff asks the players to study past players who'd worn the same number, to build an understanding of who had gone before and upon whom the Opal success had been built. I felt that was an important connecting piece to understand the history of the Opals and the players that had come before them and that had worn their particular number. Lauren Jackson spoke about her mum because her mum wore her jersey for the Opals. 
Penny Talley spoke about Timsey, because Penny wore Timsey's number seven. So there were some really great connections, you know, and Timsey was our assistant coach for that campaign. So the, to see both of them... <laughs> That's the emotion and the connection to this, this wonderful thing that is the Opals that has this immense history. I, I am passionate and I do care. Um, and I don't mind being vulnerable. Um, and that can be perceived sometimes as a weakness, but I don't feel that it is. I think it's, it's a strength if you can harness it. You know, it hurts when you, when you can't deliver for the people that you want to win with. Tim's recalls how the Opals developed such exacting techniques through elite and demanding physical preparation. We became seriously hard nosed. I mean, we'd always focused on being a great defensive team, even before I was there. That's what we, that's what the Opals did. Every single camp, we did the same drilling and it was nose in chest, dig hand, passing hand, and then shuffling as hard as you can for three steps. But the big thing I think was knowing that somebody always had your back. So you could dare to be brave and dare to challenge your offensive player because um, we had such great sync defensively that we knew if we were beaten, we had someone to rotate and have our back and then we'd scramble out of it. This was also the era of the Opal's bodysuit, loved by some, loathed by others. I loved them. Um, I was a fan of the bodysuit. I can put my hand up and say, loved them. I love what they represented. I loved the, the power of them, the, the athletic dominance we showed in them. Uh, I know they weren't for everyone, but when we ran out on the court in those uniforms, people were intimidated by us. I didn't like them, but I think the reason why we had them is when you look at people and you think she's fit, there's this change of perception, do you know what I mean? Like you start to worry about how good she is and it showed that, yeah, we were ready to go. In those bodysuits, you couldn't hide. You were fit and you earned that by the way you trained and the way you worked when no one was watching. And for me, I think that was why the bodysuits were so important and it, it established this kind of dominance but it was nice in 2012 when we went to the shorts and top. <laughs> London is host to the 2012 Olympic Games. As Australia settles into the Olympic Village, something monumental awaits one Opal, the team's captain and the greatest ever player from this nation. Is Lauren Jackson. I got pulled into the chef de mission's office and he, um, I thought I was in trouble. And he, he said, how would you like to be the flag bearer? And I was like, ah, uh, what? Are you, are you sure you've got the right person here? For an athlete to be named as flag bearer is, is huge. It's, you know, it's up there for them with a gold medal. So I remember going to meet with Nick Green, did a bit of small talk. Nick said, oh, look, I just wanted to let you know so you can prepare. We've nominated Lauren to be flag bearer. And I remember, he said, but it's top secret. You can't tell anyone, but just wanted to let you know so you can prepare. And this was like two days before our first game. So I remember thinking, how can I prepare if I can't talk to anyone? We were playing the next night against Great Britain. But Lauren was up till 4 a.m. doing live media. You know, if I had my time again and understood what those processes, I would have said, yes, she can, but she needs to be in bed by midnight. Or she, you got to do pre-records, you can't do live. Yeah, you know, again, I was a rookie. In hindsight, you know, did that impact us in the game two against France? Went to double overtime. Lauren and Liz fouled out. <sighs> Was it a f fatigue factor? Maybe, maybe not. That loss meant that we crossed over with the US where we'd rather not have in the, in the semi-final. But would I do things differently as a second time head coach? Absolutely, because now I know. There's a lot of things that I'd try and change about, you know, my career. No, not really, but that is not one of them. That is one of those moments that I'll forever hold sacred. Being able to hold the flag for your country in front of all of those athletes and then it was London and England and in front of the Queen, it's so special because it was a Queen, you know. Regardless of how other people feel about it, it's something that for me was just a real testament to my career and who I was as an athlete at that point. Penny Taylor's injury leaves a huge hole, but Liz Cambage announces herself, the first female to dunk in world competition. Having beaten Brazil, China, Canada and Russia, 
France unexpectedly throws a spanner in the works. Australia comes home with bronze. Harrower, aged 37, retires and reflects on what it means to be an opal. Um, for me, it was everything, like everything. It was my, it was my life. It was my, um, is what I'd worked so hard for. Um, it was, um, it was my dream since I was a kid. Like I didn't, I probably didn't realise, um, how successful I would have been with the Opals program, um, or how successful I would have been individually. And I think any time I put on that Opal's uniform, that's what I felt. I need to prove to people in Australia, I needed to prove to people in the rest of the world that I was still good enough at the age of 37. 2013, Coach Graff steps down. Brendan Joyce is named new head coach, just as the global superstar Lauren Jackson retires, boasting an unparalleled career. It is a profound loss to Australian basketball. Will we ever see another player like Jackson? We had up and coming Liz Cambridge, you know, at six foot eight. And we'd, we'd never had a player, you know, this amazing, young, huge athlete. Just as Jackson's successor was on the rise, Liz Cambage is hit with injury. Penny Taylor returns and is named captain of the Opals. 2014 takes the Aussies to Turkey for another FIBA world title shot, ultimately defeated by the USA in the semis, and they finish with bronze. We had great success with him in Turkey, and I think a lot of that was just him letting us play, and we lost Liz right before that tournament, so it was pretty stressful for everyone because obviously he had planned a certain way to play, and then that all got thrown out the window when you lose your 6'8 centre. So. Um, I think he managed to find a way to let us play in, in a way that suited us in that World Championships. By now, Australia has 33 Aussies playing overseas in the WNBA and in the European leagues, and new players are coming to the fore. Hodges, Mitchell, George and Tolo are flourishing. Indigenous playmaker Leilani Mitchell is a revelation. Superstar Penny Taylor is named in the World All-Star Five. Though the US is home now, it's what the Opals stand for that shines through most vividly. I don't think anyone showed up to a game with us excited to play us. And that's ideal, isn't it? My first impressions when I first joined the Opals in 98 for a training camp was wow, the intensity and the aggression that these women play with is, I remember my eyes just popping out of my head, like Robin Ma would beat me down. Trish Fallon was just graceful and strong and powerful. And Rachel Spawn was just knowledgeable about the game and she was a post player. And, and it was just like all these different levels of being the best they could be. And I remember just thinking, gosh, like, this is something special. It's back to Brazil for the 2016 Olympics. Despite overcoming the home team, then Turkey, France and Japan, the Opals lose to Serbia and crash out of the medals for the first time in six Olympic Games. It is yet another signal that other countries are on the rise. But ever the contender, disappointment does not linger long in this group. Sandy Brondello, former WNBA Coach of the Year and former Opal Olympian, is invited to apply for the head coach's job. Initially, she knocks it back twice. You know, I wanted to do it, but I thought I, I wasn't sure how it would work with living overseas. You know, I'm not an Australian-based coach and I have so much um, pride for the Opal's legacy that, you know, I wanted to make sure that that was a decision that everyone wanted. Under Rondello, the Aussies bounce back with a silver medal at the 2018 World Cup in Spain. Optimism surrounds the Opals again as they turn their attention to Tokyo. The Olympics are delayed for 12 months because of the global COVID pandemic. For every athlete that's going to the Olympics, this preparation isn't what we expected and it's not a normal preparation. 
So I know the Europe uh, teams are having some match practice, which I think um, is beneficial to them. But I also know that some really good teams are missing some really important players due to COVID. So I think everyone is affected differently. And so I think all athletes uh, in Tokyo, I think there's going to be just some really surprising um, results across all sports. So it'll definitely be one to watch. In a devastating blow for the team, superstar Liz Cambage quits on the eve of the Olympics, citing mental health concerns. It rattles the team and the coach. Losing a major player before the tournament is not ideal. You know, she's a great player and we've had, you know, pretty good success for her. We had a wonderful World Cup and, and she played a really starring role there. And But look, things just didn't work out. You know, Liz has openly talked about her mental health and, you know, everyone knows the situation that kind of went on before for the Olympics. And, you know, she's no longer a part of, obviously, this squad. Sometimes, you know, shit happens and you have to move through it, you have to learn from it. You know, go through those struggles, feel the struggles, but then learn from it and, and come out better. The Opals, scrambling for stability throughout the tournament, are rocked by Belgium in their opening game, then taken down by the US in the quarters, ultimately finishing eighth. It hurt. I have always had this saying, because I say the lesson of the experience is always positive. Even at the time, you just don't think you're going to get out of the dark tunnel. But yeah, it was tough. Playing for the, your country, you want to do well. And we, we didn't live up to our expectations. And as a coach, I mean, I took a lot of, you know, onus on that. Um, you know, a lot of things obviously out of my control, but, but that's why I say a lot of lessons. And that's why I have so much joy to come back to the program now. I feel like it's a new lease of life. And I think we've learned from those mistakes. And, you know, I think now, um, I think I, I feel like I've got way more support to put the resources in place that, that uh, you know, we learn from the past and we can move forward. But now there's a new goal, another precious chance with the 2022 FIBA World Cup in the Opal's own backyard on the lands of the Wangal people of the Eora Nation. And the excitement is building. You can feel it. We have really, really good players and you'll see their chemistry on court. They want to win and they want to do it together. I want to be that defender that she's looking for and being a part of the Opals is, it's a childhood dream. And it just, it gives me goosebumps even talking about it. And I'm taking it one day at a time and enjoying every second I get to um, in, in the Opals uniform. Sandy is a player's coach. She has played before for Australia, um, all over the world. It just brings a fresh vibe to the group. And, you know, we want to play for her. We want to win for her as well as each other. We've got a lot of talent, got a lot of scorers, figuring out a way to make everybody shine in their own way, I guess, play their roles and I think it'll be, it'll be good. I've watched World Cups before and the crowd's unbelievable and knowing that the crowd would be on our side, friends and family and everyone who supports um, basketball in Australia would be there. It would be, yeah, a dream come true and I know all the girls would be really excited and I definitely would if I were to be in that team. I'm not going to sell our team short. I think we've got such an exciting group. Um, we're going to work super hard. Like this year, we've got a great schedule in place to keep improving. And yeah, hopefully we can get on the podium. With the telling of the Opal story almost complete came an unexpected lightning bolt. Lauren Jackson reveals her desire to have the ball in her hands again. <laughs> Quietly at first, the Opal's legend, now 41, went about getting her body back to peak condition and ultimately coach Brondello confirmed Jackson's selection. Now both in awe and on tenterhooks an expectant world awaits. The Opals are coming. <laughs>